Hello, sir, we're Ponte Freed. Can I take your order, please? Lee, how did you first become involved in the sport of boxing? I first started boxing. Well, I had no choice, really. My, my dad forced me into it, <laughs> to tell you the truth. But um, my, my older brother went to the gym first. And we used to see him going off all the time, me and my younger brother, so we wanted to follow him, we wanted to join along with him. What was it about boxing that you liked and made you keep on going back to the gym and do the, all the, the hard, tough training? When, when we first started, luckily one, one of our coaches, Craig Smythe, he'd like, do like fun activities and stuff. He'd, he'd take us out, he'd take us swimming, he'd take us to play football and, and make the boxing training fun. But um, after, after a while, then you just start starting into the routine. And before you knew it, I, I was hooked. You, you mentioned your brother there, I presume it was Andrew. Yeah. Um, Andrew's uh, a world-class amateur boxer. Yeah. Was there a rivalry between you both when you were younger? Um, when we were younger, yeah, there was a, there was a bit of rivalry. We, we'd like fight in the living room with the gloves on and stuff. But um, as we got older, we'd start, start to help each other. Help each other out with the sparring and stuff in the training. And what, what did you achieve as a, an amateur boxer? Um, I won the greatest of amateur boxers, but... Um, I won the Welsh title every year I entered it, from the age of 10 until I turned professional, which was about 23, I think. Um, that was it. I didn't really box in the, in the major tournaments, like, like my younger brother did. So. What was your attitude to boxing then? So was it, were you 100% committed, or um, was it just something you did for a bit of fun? To be honest, I weren't 100% committed like I am now. I wouldn't train like I do now. I, I was just turning up and just, just going through the motions, really. Just, it was just like a routine, routine type of thing. But, um, no, I've, I've changed it around. I'm 100% focused and dedicated. What made you change your attitude towards boxing? Um, well, I got, to a, I got to a point in my, in my life where it was either make or break. And it was around about the same time my, my older brother died. And like, it was either do something then or, or, or no. And I decided boxing, boxing was, was for me and I, I put 100% into it. Do you look back on your amateur days a little bit with a, a little bit of regret? Because I mean, a lot of the, the top amateurs these days, like your brother yeah. and a number of other boxers from Wales, they get funded to yeah. basically stay amateur. They get their food, they get their accommodation, they go all over the world. I don't really look back, look back with regret because, um, well, as, as a youngster, I made, I made my mistakes. I made my mistakes doing it, doing it in the amateurs. Now, now I've turned professional, I've made the mistakes, I've learned. So I think it's benefited me in a way. Because now, now I was, and also as an amateur, like I'd mess about as a kid, I'd drink and I'd, I'd like smoke and, and mess around. So now I'm professional, I won't, I won't be doing that. I've made them mistakes early. So when you turned pro, you didn't, you didn't have a, a big promoter back in you. you. There was no fanfare. Like, yeah. It wasn't like you were a, a gold medalist mm. in the Commonwealth Games or Olympics or anything like that. So you, you fought a lot of your early fights on the small hall shows, non-televised fights. Yeah. Can you just talk about that experience? How tough yeah. it was in the early days? When I turned pro, turned pro, I turned pro with no like TV broadcast, no like, like financial backing. I started on the small hall shows earning very little money. And I've just worked my way up gradually until I got to a point where, where I was challenging for the Welsh title. I won that. And then I boxed with the Celtic title in my next fight. I won that. And then we had a call for the, for the voluntary defence to fight on a live TV show on, on Sky Sports. A voluntary defence of Stephen Smith's British and Commonwealth titles. And that was my breakout fight then. I, I won in, in good style with, a, with a, like a brutal KO. And then the TV broadcasters wanted me, so I ended up signing contracts with them. And I've just been going from strength to strength. Yeah, in that fight with Stephen Smith, people forget it now, but you were actually a massive underdog going into that fight. I think I was 7-1 to one to win. I was a massive underdog. And like something like eight, eight, 80 to one if you picked the wrong for a KO. So I go onto the phone to all my friends and family and they, they put all their, their savings on, on the table and they, they were all victorious. Were you um, surprised when you got off of that shot? Or were you sort of given a sort of nod and a wink to sort of expect it or did it just sort of come out of the blue? Um, it sort of came out of the blue. And obviously with Chris Sanniga, he was my manager and he also trained me as well as Tony Borg. He, he sort of like built up my record where I didn't have no KOs like early on. I was fighting Journey when he was telling me to just get the rounds in, learn my trade and don't, don't like lay your punches, go full force. So then obviously I had a padded record and it, like they were all wins but it looked like I couldn't punch ahead. So Stephen Smith's camp was just seeing, seeing I was ranked high and couldn't, couldn't punch ahead and thought they'd walk straight through me. So it was partly 
Chris Sandy guys playing. Well, yeah. I, I didn't see it coming myself, but I, I'm sure he was planning all that for me. And I'm only a featherweight, but I, I spar with big boys in the gym. Like I've been sparring with Frankie Borg since he's turned ball. He's, he's a big, strong middleweight. And, and like I get in with a nine stone man, and it's just like fighting a little boy. You mentioned uh, your manager there, Chris Hanega, based yeah. in Bristol. Um, I believe Chris has taken you to America sparring on a number of occasions to Mayweather Gym to, yeah. to the uh, wild card. He's taken me out to, um, to LA and Vegas. We, we've been to all, 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 the, all the gyms over America, all, all the famous gyms. And that's where I've been picking up all, all these tricks and valu invaluable experience. Can you just tell us some of the guys you've been sparring with over there? Um, what was the biggest name? I, I'm not, no, no, no big names, but they're all, they're all like at a high quality. I think last time I was in LA, the best fighter was, was um, Ronnie Rios. Mm. He, he was a top prospect. But um, it's just a different level out there, different quality of fighting. Did you find that in America, there's a lot more sparring, especially for the smaller guys like yourself? I say here, we, we have like boxing clubs, we have one trainer and like a group of boys that come to the club. In, in America, they got the boxing gyms and like different, different trainers bring their boys there and like just, just work out in the gym and there's always guaranteed sparring. Like you can go into the gym one day and you don't know who's going to turn up. And like yeah, we're in, in say like Floyd Mayweather's gym and like you've got like 50 Cent walking around and there's, <laughs> there's like famous rappers, famous boxers just walking around as well. It's like a different world. Was Floyd Mayweather in the gym when you were there? Yeah, um, I think three times we've been there and he's been training for fights. So we got to see him to spot, got to see him spar and work with like Roger Mayweather on the pads and stuff. Was it inspiring being around the guy who was rated um, by most people number one? It was also, also intimidating. <laughs> I didn't really want to like make eye contact with him. He's like walking around the gym, like shouting out stuff. And it was a bit intimidating. <laughs> and there's like guys like talking and like he's swinging his hands about his coat flies up and there's like a gun poking out of his pants. So. Man, <laughs> crazy. <laughs> did, did you and Floyd speak at all when you were out there? Um, yeah, Cornelius Bowser Edwards, he was a WBC champion. He, he sort of like runs the Mayweather gym. And of course, my manager, Chris Sanaga, he, he's like really, really friendly with him. They were, they were sparring partners back when they were both, um, back, back when they were both pros. So he, he introduced us. He, he like shook my hand, we had a photo, he signed some gloves. <laughs> When you just watch TV, Mayweather seems very brash, very arrogant, yeah. very cocky. Is that what he's like in real life? I, I think there's two sides to him. Because when he was training for the fight, I, I've been there like a few times. When he's training for the fight, he's, he's like he is on the TV. He's like outspoken, talking, trash talking, and just like strutting around. But um, then when he weren't, he weren't training for the fight, he came into the gym, he seemed like a different person. All nice, come over, shook, out, shook all the hands, and he was like a different character. Uh, since you won the British title against Stephen Smith, um, you won a string of vict victories against yeah. some big names. There were a lot of sort of people, names people would recognise yeah. if you follow sort of boxing. Um, and in that time, you have sort of improved a lot, especially in your yeah. sort of defence. Yeah. Um, can you just talk about that? Was that something you were working on? Because you were criticised a little bit that you were quite easy to hit at times. Yeah, I get, I get criticised by the, um, the TV broadcasters and the commentators all the time. But um, you've just got to take the good with the bad. Like, like this next fight, Evgeny Gradovich, he's a great fighter. I'll, I'll beat him and make, and make it look easy. And then he, they'll be making out he's a bad fighter. It's, it just comes, comes with the sport. But um, I, I have been working on my defence. Like when we're out in America, we, we obviously like watching Floyd, Floyd Mayweather train and he's like the master of it. So we try and pick up a lot of things. But um, now I've got my defence down to a team. I'm not getting caught. They're, they're making up my <laughs> opponents ain't very, ain't very good fighters. So I can't, I can't really win. Is that something that bothers you, or do you just, um, sort of just, just sort of take with a pinch of salt? It, it do a bit, but um, you know, it, it just comes with the sport. You always get criticised. I think it was on your, on your last fight, you were sort of being criticised for perhaps lack of world-class power, and then you, I mad, see, then you knocked the guy out. I see. And, and again, I'm boxing to orders, like Chris Sanigan and Tony, they're not telling me to go out and blast them out. I'm, I'm, I'm like trying to mould myself in, into like a finished article, and then when I get my opportunity, like my next fight, I can put it all, all together, the, the hard hitting, the, the classiness of the movement and the speed and put it all into one and hopefully we can watch out there. You mentioned there Chris Sanaga, your manager, he's yeah. a, an ex-pro, very yeah. experienced. Tony Borg, your trainer, an ex-pro, again, yeah. very experienced. How important is it to have in your corner guys like that who you can sort of trust? Well, well you can't beat it, can you? I got, I got like Chris Sanaga, he's one of the most experienced guys in, in British boxing and like he, he works with me on like the technical side, side of the sport, like little, little moves here and there and like Tony He's one of the best, best coaches 
in, well, he's probably the best coach in the country. And he's like one of the top trainers, hands on, like with the pads and stuff. So I, I put all my trust, trust in them in the corner. If there's things I can't see when I'm fighting, I, I put my trust into them to like tell me, like try this and I'll, I'll try it and hopefully it works out. So you can't beat them guys again, you can't. Your next fight is for the world title, the IBF version, I believe. Um, what stages are negotiations for that fight? Is there a chance that it could take place in Wales? Well, negotiations are close to being finalised. They, they're due up at the end, end of the month, so I should, I should know what's going on by the end of the week. If, if they can come to an agreement, my manager and Gradovich's manager, then the fight will go to purse bids, where like, both promoters are putting up a blind bid and the winner who puts in the, the most amount of money gets to hold the show. But um, I think they'll come to an agreement by the end of the week and hopefully we can get it in, in the UK. What type of fighter is he, the IBF champion? Um, he's, he's similar to my, to my last few opponents. Like, all my opponents have been a gradual step up and now he, he's the final test. He's a, he's a come forward, strong fighter. He's got a, well, an excellent amateur record. I think he's only lost about 15 fights out of 130. And yeah, he's really, really tough, comes forward. But um, I think you'll struggle with, with my movement and speed. Started off on the small hall shows yeah. with earning very little money, yeah. no TV coverage. Now you're on the, the cusp of a world title. Yeah. Sort of, is, is it hard to keep your feet in the ground? No, I see it easier for me to keep the, my feet on the ground. My, my family and like, the team I train with, we're, we're all down, grounded people, down to our people. But um, again, I still, I still haven't sat back and had a look and like, like look back on what I've achieved yet. Yeah. I've just been going with the flow. When I do, I'll probably burst out in tears. <laughs> so I'm just going to carry on, just keep, keep focused, keep training, hopefully win. And then when, once I've retired, then I'll look back on my career with, with joy and happiness. Hello, so we've Pontefreed. Can I take your order, please?